Hello humans, welcome to another episode of my guide to force vector design with FVD++. I hope you're excited for this one because I'm going to be sharing a simple and effective method for creating perfect woodies and the variations between different design and construction methods. Without wasting any more time, let's get started with a rehash of the basics. As we showed last time, the geometric section has similar components to the force section, this time using pitch, yaw, and roll. Unlike the force section though, the pitch and yaw act independently of one another so we don't have to keep track of the orientation of the track in the same way as with force sections. If we use the pitch to angle the track up to 30 degrees and then add some yaw to turn the track, the pitch at the end of the segment will remain at 30 degrees. This is true whether we have the function with respect to time or to distance. Likewise, if we used yaw to rotate the track to some angle and then pitch the track up or down, the amount the track was turned will be maintained. The roll is also independent of these values and simply rotates the track around the heart line regardless of pitch or yaw. For most applications, you want to set the function with respect to distance, but we can do some neat things with the function with respect to time. I'll be skipping most of the nitty gritty for the section type as it is much easier to see and understand how the track is being shaped by the graphs we manipulate as opposed to the four sections. Jumping straight into the design of some wooden roller coasters should be plenty to get you moving with geometric sections. The Philadelphia Toboggan Company and Custom Coasters International share similar design philosophies. Both use circular segments nearly exclusively to create their track shapes with straight segments periodically and the occasional force section to create simple parabolic hills. Blending the geometric section into a force section for those hills will be covered in the next episode, but for now, let's jump into a PTC coaster. Let's start with the properties of this track in FBD++. The friction parameter for wooden roller coasters is typically much lower than for steel coasters, and so we lower this value to about 0.021. Be aware that only changing the friction parameter is less precise than adjusting both the friction parameter and the friction coefficient together. For most applications, we can get away with only changing the friction parameter though, as roller coasters, especially woodies, don't have significant enough track length for this to cause major issues. I would recommend testing the ride as you go and ensuring that the speed in FBD++ matches the speed in No Limits. If the speed in No Limits is faster than in FBD++ at the end of your ride, the friction parameter is too high. If the speed in No Limits is slower than in FBD++, the friction parameter is too low. The longer your coaster is, the greater the impact of this will be. Making changes larger than 0.001 meters per meter can have adverse effects on the portion at the start of the ride, so be aware. As a sanity check, I like to quickly throw together some hills from the height I intend to design from using a geometric section with respect to distance and check that the speed at a flat and straight segment matches between no limits and FDD++ before starting the design. You can do this for any coaster style or type. Looking back at the properties, we set the heart line to 0.8 meters for this style. But this value seems to be inconsistent across wooden roller coasters, so your mileage may vary. Again, the most important idea here is to match the heartline values between FBD++ and No Limits. This coaster type doesn't use drive wheels in the station or brake runs, so we need to angle the track down slightly to allow the trains to roll out on their own. An angle of negative 1.5 degrees is suitable and can be adjusted slightly per how quickly you would like the train to begin moving. We can change this value on the anchor to see its effect immediately. After creating a simple station and lift, the considerations for the start of the geometric section are similar to what we have done before with the force section. This time though, I'll end the curve section at zero pitch and set the speed to the speed of the lift chain. We could do the same thing when dealing with force sections as well, but I like to show that there is more than one method. So choose your fancy whether using force sections or geometric sections. With the setup done, let's get into the fun part. As mentioned, the hills, valleys, and turns are created using circular segments as viewed from the top and side of each piece respectively. This is easily seen on this blueprint of Phoenix. Since we know that the pitch and yaw of the geometric section act independently of each other, we can use that to our advantage to make these shapes. Our hills and valleys are controlled by the pitch, and the turns are controlled by the yaw. In order to make these shapes circular though, we need to ensure that the function with respect to value is set to distance. This way, the adjustments made on the graph do not change as the roller coaster changes speed throughout the ride. The first drop here is a curve going straight down, so I'll set the yaw and roll to dynamic to get them moving along with the pitch. The first constant segment continues the curve from the top of the lift, 
and I'll add a cubic function to return the pitch to zero. Since our display for pitch is still in degrees per second, it's a bit of an eyeball and a fiddle with the magnitude value to get the pitch to zero. Setting this value until the degrees per second is as close to zero as possible is good enough for this application. The length of the cubic function here determines the amount of lead out from the circular segment of the drop. A shorter segment makes for a snappier transition to straight and a longer one a smoother transition. The combination of the first constant function and the cubic function lengths lead to various steepness for the drop. Ideally, I am trying to keep the drop to no more than 55 degrees. I've gone for a short constant and long cubic for a nice drawn out drop. Not much airtime provided here, but we do avoid using a longer straight segment before the valley by doing this. Typical of this style. If you need the end of this segment to go lower, we can increase the radius of the curved segment of the lift and start the process again. The more you do this, the more drawn out and forceless the drop becomes. Pulling up into the valley of this drop is achieved with another cubic function extended out to create another circle. As I extend this out, I'm watching the Y acceleration value and making sure it doesn't go above 3.5 or so. These 6-seater PTC trains are super heavy and put a ton of stress on the wooden structure below, and as such, are typically designed with lower vertical g-forces than what is found on steel coasters. Another cubic function rounds off this valley and completes the circular segment. These three functions, the cubic, constant, and cubic, form the basis for every shape we will make for the rest of the ride. The primary difference will be the magnitude at which we go to and the duration of each piece. As the ride slows down throughout the course, these circles will gradually get tighter if we try to hit similar vertical g-forces in the valleys. Either by product of their age or by their design, these woodies often mellow some by the end of the ride. So I'll start with heavier g-forces in the first few valleys and gradually back off as I design each valley. The same can be said for the airtime hills and turns as well. From here, let's make an airtime hill. These hills, again, are circular, and so come with some considerations. We know from our force sections discussion that gravity acts downward at a constant rate, which for the airtime hills before led to a parabolic hill as we wanted a constant zero-g floater hill. This time though, our hill is circular, so the faster moving train at the start of the hill leads to more forceful negative g-forces that gradually decrease as it reaches the peak. So, right away, we need to consider how hard these forces are applied. As I make the first cubic function, I'm again watching the y acceleration value to make sure it doesn't go too far into the negative. Remember that we are calculating these forces based on the middle of the train and that the first car is moving faster through this part, leading to higher forces there. Negative 0.5 g's is a good rule of thumb maximum for this coaster type, but you should be testing how the forces are actually applied once in the simulator and adjust accordingly. Extending out the hill to level pitch, I check the speed once again to make sure the train travels over the hill with enough speed. If there isn't enough speed here, I will go back to the constant function that is the valley previous, shorten its duration and check the y acceleration after the cubic function and the speed after the constant function comes to level pitch until I am happy with both values. Finishing off the airtime hill is done with another cubic function, again considering the magnitude of the y acceleration. This time at the end of the constant function since that is the point of maximum negative g-force at the end of the hill. Creating another valley as we did before will lead the coaster into the next element where we finally get things turning with a turnaround. But before we create the turnaround, we're starting to notice some issues. Namely, the software is starting to slow down as we continue to add more functions to the graph. There is an easy fix though as we can simply start a new geometric section. This can be done at any time, but for my own organization, and for this particular ride style, I like to do so when the pitch and yaw have both returned to zero, giving the next geometric section an easy starting place and one I know is set where I want it. Starting the turnaround, the same considerations of the Y acceleration at the end of the cubic function are made as the ride enters the start of the element. We level the track to just past the horizon this time so the train has a gentle downward slope to ensure it doesn't stall in the turn. A small straight section precedes the turn this time, just for style. Creating the turn is done in the same way that the valley and airtime hill was. That is to say that it starts and ends with a cubic function and a constant function in between. Since the focus is now shifted to the yaw, I uncheck the dynamic setting on the yaw and set the pitch and roll to dynamic now. As I change the values for this cubic function starting the turn, I look to the x acceleration to ensure that this value does not exceed far past 1g. 
Again, these PTC trains are quite heavy and put a large load on the structure. The unbanked turn here shows the lateral force that is pushing on the structure as the train rounds the corner. We'll also want to consider how tight this turn is and ensure the trains do not pinch laterally because of the radius of the turn. Have I stressed that testing your rides as you go is important yet? I'll finish off this turnaround and start the shaping of the next drop before coming back to the roll. We're not going to leave riders with 1G of constant lateral force through this turn. We want to bruise their ribs, not break them. With the general shape of the turnaround complete, we can look back at how much banking we want to apply to get comfortable yet exciting forces for riders around the turn. I'll prepend a constant segment of roll and extend it a bit before the hill levels out. This is where the banking will start. The banking here starts early so that the wheel assemblies do not pierce the train due to too high of a roll rate coming into the turn, like what was shown in the roll rates episode. We want to achieve enough banking to get the forces correct around the turn, but are limited to how fast we can do so, and with the six-seater PTC trains being longer than the four-seater, we're even more limited. We could include a longer straight section before the turn starts if we want the banking to happen only on the flat portion, but this isn't as exciting. You may consider this if you're making a din or togo though. No shade thrown at din or togo. Okay, maybe a little shade thrown at din. We know that the X acceleration at the end of the turn will be greater than that of the start since we are aiming to maintain a constant roll angle while the train speeds up around the downward and circular turn. I'm looking for the turn to end with about 0.5 G's of X acceleration, so I'll use a quartic function at the start of the turn and check the end. After checking to ensure this roll into the turn doesn't cause issues, I'll mirror the quartic function to unroll the train as it dives into the next valley. With all things equal but opposite, the train returns to zero roll. I will set this quartic function to begin just before the straight starts so that the banking feels like it is held until the very last moment. We're looking for the train to start unrolling and stop turning at the same time, and because the quartic function gradually increases, we can push the start of the unrolling just a bit before the end of the actual turn. As we continue the rest of the ride, we can make adjustments to the angle of this turn by changing the magnitude of the pitch and roll the same amount as we do the yaw. This helps to retain the unrolling placement as changes are made. I've rounded out this example with some bunny hills, and here is the result. Now that we have a really good understanding of how to create circular drops, valleys, and turns using geometric sections, let's spice things up a bit with a Custom Coasters International example. This is more or less the same process, but we're going to be introducing yaw and pitch at the same time to achieve the shaping found on typical CCI coasters. The properties such as the friction parameter and heart line remain the same from the previous example, and so too does the design at the crest of the lift hill, so we can jump straight into the heart of the ride. The first drop and valley are nearly identical to the previous example, but on a slightly larger scale. I'll grab a new geometric section just for this turnaround, again making the change when the pitch and yaw rate is at zero. When we get to the first turnaround is when things start to get interesting. We make the same considerations with the Y acceleration as before when coming into the hill. Then, to get the iconic CCI shaping of this turnaround, we're going to simply extend the crest of the hill into the first part of the turn. I will typically keep everything adhered to the pitch of the ride as I go, but you can switch to the yaw here like we did before since the turning is the focus. The turn starts with a cubic function just at the crest of the hill and follows the same cubic constant cubic setup we've been working with. We can let the X acceleration ride higher this time given the more aggressive nature of CCIs, 2G's maximum this time. We'll do the same cubic constant cubic with the pitch adjusting the values until the crest of the second hill and turn happen at the same time with the second crest being slightly lower than the first. With the basic shape of the turn complete, let's go back and look at the roll. I use simple, typically unaltered, quartic functions for the roll here. The roll happens in four sections for this element. 
The first quartic function begins as soon as the pitch starts curving back down for the first hill and does the majority of the rolling for the turn to bring some of the laterals down. Another quartic function increases this roll slightly until the center of the turn to further reduce the laterals, which have increased with a speeding up train without set roll. These two are more or less mirrored as the train exits the element. The way CCI rolls through elements is slightly more organic than older woodies, and so we can't simply mirror the values exactly to get back to zero degrees, especially in this case as the ride continues to roll in order to make a fast bank turn coming right up next to the lift. In order to get the supports to line up nicely as the track runs next to the lift, we need to set 3 meters of space between each section. Since I have a pre-drop that sets the lift slightly away from the grid, or for cases where you are not on the grid at all, another track can be made to show this spacing. I most commonly will use something like this. A 100 meter straight section, a curve with no lead in or lead out that turns 180 degrees with a very large radius, another 100 meter straight section, and another large 180 degree curve, again with no lead in or lead out and with 1.5 meters less radius than the previous curve. A 100 meter straight section will round out the spacer. I can then move and rotate this track until it lines up with the piece of track I want to space, giving me a clear marker within FED++ to line up my track. We can then snug the track up to this marker as closely as possible without crossing it, knowing things will be nicely lined up once we auto support the ride in the simulator. I make the curves very large, as two small curves can have enough degree of error that the straight sections are not exactly 3 meters apart or are not perfectly parallel. And with that, we have all the tools to create perfect wooden roller coasters for no limits. You can go into the simulator and tweak some of the nodes in order to add in some potholes or age spots to your ride if you really want to make it feel authentic. I hope this has helped you in understanding how to create some of the basic wooden coaster styles with FED++. I have not covered GCI coasters this time, as they are quite a lot more complicated and deserve a video all their own. GCI coasters have some of the most intricate and rapid direction changes on wind roller coasters, but many of the ideas we talked about here will apply. You just have to include many, many more changes to the graphs. Setting the geometric section with respect to time instead of distance is also necessary. If you know this coaster style well, and the intricacies and nuances that are used in the design, I have faith that you could work it out from what you've learned here. Once I wrap up this series, I may return to flesh out a GCI coaster. If you're wondering how to make a gravity group coaster such as the Voyage or an Intamin Prefab like El Toro, you've already got the skills to do so as these coaster styles use force sections primarily. You'll simply need to introduce some lateral forces into the mix for the gravity group and maybe not so much for the Intamin. Thanks for tuning in and until next time, be safe, be healthy, be kind.